a divergence. Economists also have a way of uh, estimating labor market discrimination, which means that you analyze wages that individuals are paid and try to see the difference in, wa in average wages or wages along the, along the wage distribution. Try to see the difference, what, what part of the wage gap can be attributable to things like education, experience, age, etc., and what part cannot be so accounted. The part that cannot be accounted is, you, is seen as a proxy for labor market discrimination. If you do that exercise, you find actually that over the last 15 years, labor market discrimination, which means payment, wage payments in, the, in that group of employees that actually receive regular wages. So we are not talking about uh, informal sector or casual or unpaid worker, workers, etc. These are individuals who receive regular wages and salaries. If you see, if you examine that, then in fact there has been an increase in labor market discrimination um, over the last 20 years. And if, if you, if you uh, break this up into, into slices of, of, of wage brackets, then you find actually that the increase in this overall discrimination is accounted for by an increase in discrimination at the top end of the wage distribution. What does the top end of the wage distribution mean? These are individuals who earn the highest amongst all wage earners. This is the sector that swears by the name of merit or ability. We are constantly told that reservations are bad because they compromise on merit. But what we find is that when we account for merit and ability, you still find the highest gap that is unexplained at the top end of the distribution. So a sector that swears by the name of merit or meritocracy is one which is, which is actually seen an increase in discrimination, which is an unaccounted for wage gap that cannot be accounted for by characteristics. That should give us, that should give us something to pause and think about, which is why is it that we see discrimination in a sector that's supposed to be meritocratic? I'll come to that in a minute, but this is uh, one picture. Now, in the last, um, I would say, 10 years or so, we've also heard a parallel narrative which is saying that, okay, labor markets, wage markets discriminate. Dalits face discrimination in, in if they try to apply for jobs. Why should they apply for jobs? Be job givers, not job seekers. Have you heard this slogan? Okay. This is the slogan of the Dalit Industrial Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the DICI. Their slogan is, be job givers, not job seekers. So the point is, why apply for jobs if you're going to be discriminated against? Why not set up your own businesses and give jobs to other Dalits? Sounds good. And it sounds like that might be a way out of discrimination. And indeed, if you look at the website of the Dikki, then you find that there are about 160 uh, billionaires. Uh, who are Dalits, who battled immense odds to reach the position that they have reached and we must salute their efforts and their courage and the fact that they didn't count out to the institutional discriminatory structure and reach where they did. But in order to see whether Dalit capitalism or this, this slogan of be uh, job givers not job seekers, in order to see whether this can actually provide a way out of exploitation, we need to see a picture of all Dalits involved in self-employment or businesses, not just the top end of these Dalit millionaires. So I've also worked on that data, which is micro, small and medium industry enterprises data, which, are, which is a census, which is all businesses. And there you find actually that if you analyze that data, and this is now we are talking about 15 lakh, 20 lakh, uh, uh, data points. So these are, you know, a very large data set. And if you analyze that, you find actually that Dalits are, Dalit businesses, Dalit owned businesses and Adivasi owned businesses are actually smaller. Uh, about 40% of so it, uh, on average are own account enterprises, which means only one person rents it. So in other words, if there's a person selling chai alone, that would be count, counted as a business. So a large number of a very large number of Dalit enterprises are bottom of the rung survivalist enterprises and not entrepreneurial at all. So it's not the end that 
the dickies is is is, uh, is aiming at and you can imagine that they you can imagine that they were probably pushed to doing these survivalist activities because they couldn't get decent employment so it's not an escape out of labor market discrimination it's because of labor market discrimination and lack of access to education that individuals end up doing survivalist activities because they have to do something to survive so the bulk of dalit businesses don't follow the dalit billionaire model and they are in no position to actually be job givers they are in that so there is a there is a small upper crust to these businesses but that's minuscule the bulk of dalit businesses are actually not in a in, a, in a, any position to provide other dalits with a way of escaping labor market discrimination and i'm not even going into the question of whether capitalism can uh, you know so the slogan is dalit capitalism and we have some uh, insights from the black capitalism the movement in the united states i'm not even going into the question of whether that's a viable alternative etc uh, you know that can be discussed another time but let's assume it is but even if it were to be the reality is that today dalit businesses don't have the wherewithal to provide uh, jobs to other dalits who are battling labor market discrimination so it's in the labor market uh, we are characterized by discrimination in the small business sector majority of dalits are not in a position to give jobs we tried to analyze using another data set is just as there is labor market discrimination which means that there is a wage gap that cannot be accounted for by characteristics is there discrimination against dalit business owners so there are qualitative accounts uh, professor jodhka from your university has extensively documented uh, uh, discrimination against dalit businessmen in punjab and there are other such accounts we tried we wanted to see look at business earnings data and try to see whether there is discrimination etc turns out that even in business earnings if you decompose the business earnings then in fact dalit there is a part of the earnings gap that cannot be accounted for by characteristics so not only do dalits face discrimination in in job markets they also face discrimination when they become business owners. and why not i mean when you think about it why should one expect that a society and the institutional structure that discriminates against dalits and adivasis in the labor market in the job market why should those discriminatory tendencies be completely missing from uh, from the arena uh, uh, that 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 business is occupied there's a land market there's a credit market there's a consumer uh, you know a, a consumer market why would you not see discrimination there and indeed you do in fact find uh, data does support uh, uh, the this view that there is in fact discrimination against dalits um, in the in businesses so the point is that um so then of course you come to the the second question that i raised earlier which is well but what about all the political representation what about all the quotas so there is you know there is an increase in political representation there's an increase in not an increase in quotas but there have been quotas in uh, in operation for um, for so many years why hasn't that changed anything why do we still continue to find these disparities why do we continue to find divergence why do we continue to find uh, discrimination uh, is, is it not time for quotas to uh, be abolished because obviously they're not doing their job that's that's a standard question that gets asked so here we need to understand that first of all reservations or quotas in universities colleges and public sector jobs is a very affects a very tiny part of the economy a large part of the economy of of jobs and even education actually the private uh, the private educational institutions are free from the purview of quotas what quotas do in my view is that they increase the representation of groups that would otherwise not be represented in institutions of higher learning so in my view they desegregate the elite and in itself i think that's a very very important objective but quotas or reservations cannot be seen and should not be seen as a magic wand that is going to solve the multifaceted nature of caste disparities and when people say quotas have failed what they are saying is that quotas didn't work like a magic wand they didn't abolish poverty they didn't redistribute land 
they didn't uh, you know equalize access to health well they were not meant to there should have been other policies for that so by expecting quotas to be a magic wand and then saying look they failed i think that's unfair quotas should be assessed on the basis of what they were intended to do it's a it's a complex multifaceted problem and it needs a complex multifaceted policy approach reservations in colleges and uh, 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 in jobs perform a particular role which they do but for all other problems we need other policies now let's come to what quotas actually do and what rohit pemula's suicide tragic suicide last year uh, brought home to all of us with a shock is that quotas are only the first step they provide access to a university seat but because quotas are a policy that that is politically not popular and because access is mandatory it's constitutionally mandated so it has to be given but announcement of the quota is often seen perhaps not in jnu but certainly in other parts of the country the announcement of a quota is often seen as the beginning and end of the affirmative action policy so quotas are announced individuals get admitted and that's it after that the university or the institution or the college feels that they have done their job and after that if those who are admitted on quotas sink or swim or get assimilated or get discriminated or not none of this is is something that the institutions feel that they need to be concerned with and what the rohit vemula episode reminds us is that we should see access to a to an institution whether education or jobs that means implementation of the first step of the quota as only the beginning of affirmative action and not its end you know i was trying to get data on you know what how, how many numbers of people have accessed quotas um, uh, over the over the years and you would think it's such an important government policy so there must be a government institution or a or a department that keeps all this data and i and my students have been at it for the last 5 months and we have a data set but it's full of so many gaps because we cannot find a single agency and even the agency that are supposed to be monitoring these policies have absolutely no clue and this is only at the central level at the state government level we file right to information application